Welcome Kent Dirk exploring HDR. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I just want to first say thank you, Carlos, for inviting me here in the IVRPA. It is quite an honor to be here today. Uh, this is my first year being at the event. Uh, also, I want to say it's been fantastic uh, being online for a couple of years now and uh, chatting with people and getting to meet you all firsthand. It's been something that uh, I just can't put into words how fantastic that's been for me. Um, today, I've got a presentation in Exploring HDR. It's actually divided into two sections. I want to show you a little bit about my background and my earlier days as an artist. Uh, um, um, what I'm doing now, I still have my day job. This is just a hobby, something I want to do that's anti-work related, something to do for fun. Uh, and then how I discovered HDR back in uh, maybe the late part of 2006, 2007, and how I implemented that into my hobby. Uh, the second part of it is the actual some little bit of technical information, particulars of HDR. Uh, and I want to actually show you my recipe for how I produce an HDR panorama. So uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I actually flew here. This is where I live, uh, Columbia, Missouri. It's in the heartland of the United States. A lot of trees, creeks, woods, rural farmlands. I flew backwards in time to get here, about 7,000 kilometers. But for my day job, for the last 32 years, I work for a huge corporation. I've done a lot of different projects. One I really like to do, here's a couple examples. Uh, I went to school in the early 70s for technical illustration design. I can draw just about anything to absolute scale and pictorial uh, types like isometric, diametric, different types of drawings and I design huge trade show exhibits. I actually do the fabrication work on them, and I've been all over the United States in large exhibit halls setting up these structures. They actually fit on a semi. I deal with the Teamsters, Freeman decorators. I really love it. I get, a, get the days off during the show to go and relax and see the sights while all the suits take over the sales guys in, in the exhibit itself. And then I come back in three or four days and tear it down and bring it home. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Here's a couple examples of This is the latest one I designed. Um, also, I do architectural renovations. I design uh, for a corporate facility and I hire guys to help me. I'm kind of like the general contractor, but some of it I also do the building part of it as well. And I've been a tinker and a hobbyist all of my life as well. I used to build go-karts myself when I was a little kid. I designed, built a tree house in the backyard for my kids. Uh, about six or seven years ago, way up uh, in Paris, Missouri, I discovered an old sailboat from 1974, totally sunk down in the woods, full of water. I got a tractor and drug it out of the woods and I restored it from the ground up and learned to go sailing. Well, it's kind of hard to get all this rigging together and we did it for a year or two, getting friends together. And once you set all the rigging up, you want to stay on it all night. So after it sat in the driveway more than I used it, my wife has convinced me to sell it, so got rid of that. I built, uh, this is actually where I work out, this is an addition I built on the back of my house myself. A few years ago, I restored a 1969 Playmore camper and we drove it all, towed it all the way up to uh, Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island and went camping in it. About a month before I came out here, I found it on eBay, an old 80 year old guy about Oh, 30 miles from me had it. It's a 1977 Playmore. I've actually, this is the state when I first got it home, gutted the whole thing right before I left. And when I get back, I want to restore this. And this is something that 360, we can go further extend the range of our travels and adventures, stay all night in it. We're also starting to do a few art festivals. So this gives us a little place to stay when we do stuff like that. Um, Next section, I just want to show you a few of the images that I shot back in the early days, starting in the 70s. I've always been interested in creating art and imagery, and it seems like photography was just another medium for me to explore and, and to create and express myself as an artist. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this slideshow. 
I had my own dark room at home. I took about 7,000 black and white negatives and processed them all. And as you can see, these are nudes, but the environments are abandoned places. During these years, I learned how to process film, printing, and the zone system. A few years later, I got married and my career started and my own personal art kind of went into hibernation. It's an old saying that marriage is death in ours, and there is a little bit of truth to that. Um, so, I decided to buy an RV and travel with my family. Well, it did kind of like what the sailboat did. We used it a little bit now and then, and it sat in the driveway most of the time. So, we ended up selling it. And then I remember Back in the late part of the 90s is QuickTime VR Authoring Studio, and actually for my work, I made tiny little cynical movies. It probably was like one megabyte. You need to speak tiny, closer to the microphone. Thing. Tiny little QuickTime VR movies. So I started with part of the money we sold from the RV. I gave part of it to my wife. I kept part of it. And I didn't have a hobby. So I started researching online, and I seen these cats over in Europe were making full screen spherical panoramas. I was just like blown away by it. It's like, man, I'll, that's something I want to do, and I can get back into photography again. So I bought some several different pano heads and tried them. Finally ended up with a really good system. Actually, Matthew from uh, 360 Precision, he's seen some of my work, and I use the 360 Absolute awesome piece of the hardware. Um, I get a lot of hardware and software free people like what we're doing here. But there was a couple of problems when I started shooting pan. Something new for me to do. And with my background in shooting old abandoned places, you know, I shot a cat and a dog and a tree and it's like, what next? And I mean, you know, these old houses. So I went in there and shot this old house, but there was problems. All the windows were blown out. Shadows were really dark. It just didn't work right. So I'd take two panoramas. I'd shoot one for the outside exposures and one for the inside. I'd get home, I'd lay them on top of each other, mask all this stuff out, and then put the two together to create one pan panorama. But then I realized this is going to be a lot of work, and it's just, it's just going to be impossible to keep shooting doing this. So uh, I researched a little bit about uh, how to solve this as a solution for it. There was another problem. When I first started doing the old houses, I would go by myself. It's uh, really dangerous. Uh, there's wells that get grown over in the grass. And if I could fall into one of these, nobody would find me for days, wouldn't even know where I was at at all. So, um, and a couple of times too, I'd be out in these places and I'd kind of go through them real carefully, looking around by myself, my heart's beating. I like horror movies, so my mind starts spinning with all this stuff in my mind. And it looks, you know, it's okay, nobody's here. And then I set my pano head up one time, and all of a sudden, bam, there's this huge noise in this back room, and I grabbed my tripod, and I just ran for the car and took off. So, I have two partners in crime now. This is Lori and Cindy, and they was at home the whole time I was out by myself. I said, why don't you girls come with me? And they sit in the car and play cards and chat, well, I was in shooting the house, at least there'd be somebody with me. Then I had the idea, it's like, why don't I give them cameras, and while I'm shooting the panoramas, they can go around and shoot the detail shots of all the junk and stuff that are left in these places. So I gave them a few... You need to speak really close, okay. Okay. I gave them a few photography lessons, and they have shot, they actually fell in love with it, they shot thousands of the images on our site. And the thing I've noticed here at the festival, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of women in the field of panoramic photography. Lori is quite interested in this, and I think I want to teach Lori how to shoot uh, panoramas when I get back, so. Uh, wish they was here today to see this. Now, this is a map of Missouri. This is where I live, right here. And we get out for the first uh, 60 weeks when we started doing this, rain, shine, storm, snow, I didn't care. We were like, every Saturday morning, we'd meet at my house at 7 o'clock and we'd go out shooting. This is a 50-mile radius of my house and these are some of the little red dots are actually where some of the towns and places we go exploring. Um, we leave the house at 7. Let me catch up on my notes here. 
We've searched thousands of miles of gravel roads, and in some of these little towns, there may be only 20, 30 people, but there might be a place to eat. We stop it for lunch. We usually shoot two locations on a Saturday. But the best finds is when we get to talk to some of the old farmers hanging around in these towns, and they'll say, oh yeah, Charlie, my buddy, go up and talk to him down this gravel road here. Over 100 years, the roads aren't around anymore where these old places are at, and they're sitting way back in the fields. Or during the summertime when all the brush and vegetation grows up, you can barely even see them at all if, if possible. So a lot of times during the winter when all the leaves are gone, we'll go and search for them and flag them and, and come back to them later when, when they grow up. Uh, so I created a website. This is like about the fourth or fifth generation of it since uh, 2007. We have almost 2,000 HDRI panoramas online. Um, this is the directory. These are the locations. Each place itself, as much information as I can give my users, there's different things you can jump right into them. The photographs, I have GPS coordinates on there now. Sometimes I do special little things that really interest me. I might design a special section just to that that I include in this location itself. Uh, here's an example. I just, I've been shooting, um, creating everything in QuickTime BR. So over the winter months, I went through everything and I taught myself KR Pano, which I really love. It's got a lot of great features, but uh, it's all done with a lot more user interaction features than QuickTime VR offered me. Uh, we have almost 9,000 photographs online set up in the same directory of five pages. Um, just for fun, learn how to do the mobile thing. Don't get a lot of hits on it, but uh, um, right before I left, I checked the stats. We maybe had five hits in the United States, and the oddest thing in China, we had 650 for one, one side of China. And what really blows me away is that we get hits because of the internet from people all over the world. It just, it's truly amazing that maybe there's some guy in a little tiki hut on an island somewhere with a laptop looking at what we do back in Missouri. It's, it's just quite fascinating. Uh, years ago, uh, we were featured in VR Magazine. Thank you, Marcos. Marco, that really helped uh, us get some uh, publicity about our hobby and kind of helped put us on the map. Uh, we've been featured in all of our local newspapers, radio stations, and uh, um, I can hardly leave the, I have people come up to me in the store that recognize me. I don't even know who these people are. They say, oh, you Kent Dirk, and it's like, yeah, and they want to talk to me and stuff. It's kind of nice. And actually, right now, back in Columbia, Cindy and Lori are doing an art festival for me. It's of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit there. Luckily, it's not raining. There'll be 25,000 people over a course of two days. I've, we set, rent a little piece of real estate, and we've got a little art tent, 10 by 10 art tent, and there'll be thousands of people go through there. I didn't even know. I'm kind of testing the sales. We need some funds for gas and lunch money. And believe it or not, we do really well selling pictures of creepy old rotting stuff. Uh, we'll probably make $6,000 US in the next two days at this festival. We've done three gallery shows. Our very first gallery show, we had 800 people attended on our opening night. The gallery thing, I'm not too crazy on. They get too much of the commission, and it's just it's too much work, and they get all the money, so I'm not too hip on that. Now, in these places we go, we see all kinds of stuff laying around. We don't ever take anything. Um, but sometimes I find photographs or evidence or checks with people's names on them. And I've actually taken some of the photographs we found in a closet one time, a whole shoebox full of them, way back in maybe like from the 20s and 30s. I took them home, scanned them. Next time we went out, I actually took them back and put them in the closet and left them there. But I want to show you some of the people that might have lived in these places in a small sampling of the type of environments that we shoot.
a couple of times we've taken uh, maybe a piece of junk out of the house, something with no one would have no value, and I'll take it back home, and I've been making some image object movies out of it, just another way to convey information about these places. Uh, what's missing in the panoramas and images is how quiet these places are. It's only the wind or maybe some birds flying by. It's absolutely, totally silent there. And what we've noticed too is that these are in a certain point of decay, all these places. Everything in this world is going back into the ground. A lot of these places are totally enclosed with vines. It looks like something's grabbing onto it and pulling it back into the ground slowly. I have about 2,000 of these images. Um, not all of them to me are art. It's, it's, there's only a few that really, really I like. A lot of them we just were working for documenting these places, whether they turn out to be beautiful or not, we shoot them. And the um, thing I've noticed too, everyone leaves their shoes when they leave this world. We find shoes all the time in these places. A couple of weeks ago, I kind of took a break from working on this and the art festival. We went out exploring, and I made a little movie. So today I'd like to take you and show you this movie. It's about one minute long, and let, it, let you join us on one of our adventures. I have a thousand stories of the places we've been in and the people we've met along the way. And a few of them really stand out in my mind. Um, it's been a few years ago, but we ran into, we was in a really small town, had three houses. We stopped in the local store to have lunch. There was an old lady there and we kind of, we take the newspaper with us and we show her what we do. You know of any place? And she said, well, have you been up this big mansion up the road here? And I was like, no, because we'll be up one road and we've been down this other road. So we said, hey, you think it'd be all right? We take photographs. She said, well, sure, sure. So we got in the car, Lori, Lori was with me, drove up the road and as soon as we arrived, huge no trespassing sign. Well. 
the old lady in town said it was okay. So we thought, we started to get out of the car, started to climb over the fence to head back to the house. You can see it back there in the field. Gates start swinging open. Well, Lori said, well, let's just get in the car and we'll just drive back there and shut the gate. Nobody will see us. So we did. Drove back to the back side of the house. This house was built in 1902. It was a grand mansion at one time, all hand built. Um, it was a wealthy family from St. Louis, Missouri, built it. You can notice the central center tower here. It's actually a water tower up here. They pumped water out of the well out back and they actually had a bathtub and a sink in 1902 upstairs here. But the family hated each other, but they lived in the same house. So one other part of the family lived in this half and the other part of this half. And there was one door that separated the two halves. Um, so we're putting our equipment together and all of a sudden I hear some guy go, hey, what are you guys doing? And I look over and there's some guy coming out of one of the outbuildings back down the road there, all in the property. So it's like, oh, we're busted. You know, I can't run. I got to go over and talk to him. So I went over and started talking to him. He said, what are you doing on my property? And I said, well, the old lady in town said, it'd be all right to take some pictures. Well, hell, I'm the owner. I said, well, if you're the owner, then you're the guy I need to talk to. So when I started showing him what we did, he really took interest in, in, in our project and took us on a tour of the place and told us some of the history about the people that lived there. Um, this is the original family member that the old lady in town actually gave me a tin type of. I returned to her. And there was a guy, he's one of the family members here. His name is Jimmy Gill. Well, Brian, the current owner, showed us, and we would have never discovered it, a long time ago, you could bury your family members in your yard. So this is a graveyard that's kind of back over in the woods of some of the old, the original settlers of their family members from the pioneer days. But Brian told me this amazing story. Jimmy Gill lived in that house until almost 2003, I believe, until his death. Uh, he was real eccentric. He was in his 80s, and he lived in a little 10-foot stone building out back of the house. Brian would go out and give the guy company and give him food, and because the house was in such bad shape, the old man would still get around the house to tear the slats off the plaster walls. Well, he used to make plaster walls back then to cook his food in the little 10-foot building that lived out back. You can see him right here the metal Brian put down in the house for the old guy to get around in there. Well, in the back of the house, the guy would open up his cans of food and throw them on the ground. And you can see over years of time, they almost covered up the furniture that was in this room. And as of today, his dirty underwear and his big shaver still hang in one of the closets of the house. The thing that we have to be, uh, it's on our utmost concern is being safe when we go in these places. They're really dangerous. We don't want to get hurt. We want to take the photographs and get out of there. And there is all kinds of nasty things in there. In Missouri, we have black widow spiders, the brown recluse spider. This one's a pretty big one, but they're actually the size of a dime. If you get bit by one of these things, this is an example of what it can do to your skin and even worse. There's wasps, mosquitoes, ticks. I've had to pull 20, 30 ticks off my legs even though we spray with bug sprays. There's chiggers. We see vultures in these things up living up in the attics. We can hear them moving around sometimes while we're downstairs shooting. If they throw up on you, they will eat the paint off your car. Their vomit's real acidy. Uh, there's poisonous snakes, copperheads, watermark. We see raccoons all the time into these locations. Uh, some of them could have, dis there's diseases from them. Uh, rusty nails, broken glass, and over the decades, a wooden floor that's solid like this becomes paper. And we've actually fell through uh, several floors. We always case the outside of the place. We watch every step we take when we're doing this process. Um, you could it'd be a lot better, a lot of them were built on stone foundations, and we fell through it maybe a foot, a foot and a half, and you land right on the ground of your leg but it's a hell of a fall if you go eight feet, and a lot of them have water down the basements. It'd be a serious situation. Also in these places, there is, we've seen asbestos, uh, farming chemicals, and different types of poison. 
but truly the most scariest thing of all that we can can encounter in some of the really remote we call them boonies way out in the middle of nowhere is some of the locals themselves <laughs> uh, you can kind of spot them too and I'm from the country and I can speak their language to a certain degree and get along with these guys but they have no concept of what a art is or a photograph we've been caught a couple of times up with them they had gun racks and guns in the house y'all need to come out and out of there yeah uh, what are you doing in there you got enough pictures you need to leave so we did and I and I almost had the place shot and I thought and I just couldn't get it off my mind it's like I almost got it shot so the next day I skipped out of work early after we had been ran off there and I drove back to the location snuck back in there and got the last two shots I needed and got my car and took off but uh, so far we've been lucky but uh, it's kind of scary now this is the second part of my presentation it's about HDR itself um, let me flip ahead here a little bit. HDR, and some of this I'm going to read because to me it can get really, really technical. And as an artist, and I give, give an analogy, I've been painting for years. And if I go to an art store and I buy a tube of red paint or yellow paint, I get home, I want to squeeze it out and make it happen. I don't care what it's made of necessarily and HDR can get really really deep so I kind of researched some of this for my speech and some of it I'm just going to read off to you to the, make sure it's correct um, there's two flavors of it photorealism and hyperrealism the hyperrealism part to me really appeals to me as an artist it allows a lot of um, room for creative expression and flexibility uh, so that's kind of my focus. I encourage you to uh, explore both of them, the photorealism. HDR itself does offer a lot as photographers uh, to increase your tonal range of your images and photorealism is totally possible with it. Uh, HDR has actually been around forms of it since the 1850s. There was a guy called Gustave Le Gray, a French photographer, this was photographing the sea, and it was such a great difference in the luminance values of these. What he did is he shot two negatives and printed them separately on a piece of paper, the sea itself and the sky. And it almost made him internationally famous, his work. But that was a hundred and something years ago. The digital stuff at this point first came out in 1997 by a guy named Paul DeBeck. I think he owns HDR shop. He's got a website now online from the University of California, Berkeley. And it was released at SIGGRAPH, 97. And what he did is Kodak Photo CDs. Shot it with film, put it on Kodak Photo CD. I guess he created a little program. And this is an example of the bracketed set of images that he shot and a tone map version of it. I was reading some about him online and it gets really, really deep. Mathematics, I don't even understand half. I don't want to. But there's, it, just, it goes pretty deep on some of this. Um, okay, let's see. HDR, or high fidelity photography, is a set of techniques that allows the capture of a greater dynamic range of luminance between the lightest and darkest values of an image than standard digital photographic methods. This wide range allows HDR images to more accurately represent the range of luminance values found in the real world ranging from direct sunlight to faint starlight. The human eye can see a range of 10 to 14 EV value, EV, and some arguably say as high as 22 EVs depending on your vision. But what the limitation is, uh, let me see here, real world scenes contain light ranges that can exceed a 50,001 contrast ratio. Scenes with high dynamic range are often represented on low dynamic range devices. 
cutting off the darkest and brightest values. If you want to output an HDR image onto paper or onto a display, you must somehow convert the wide range of intensity values in the image into a lower range supported by the display or device. This is a chart showing uh, time and f-stop in relationship to EV numbers. I shoot in this range right here. I don't take meter readings. I've been doing this for so long, I can tell that's a really brightness of that. I want to start at this point. I start at the uh, longest exposure first and just run it up the scale. And if I'm in a really dark room, I can say, oh, maybe this room's dark enough. I want to start at 15 seconds or 30 seconds. Shoot all my stuff at F16 or F30, F22, even if it was in this room as dark as it is here. Okay, next. Using tone mapping reduces this dynamic range of contrast within the entire image while retaining localized contrast between the neighboring pixels. The information stored in the dynamic range images typically corresponds to the physical values of luminance that can be observed in the real world. This is different from traditional digital images for, which represent colors that should appear on a monitor or a paper print. HDR image formats are often called scene referred in contrast to traditional Im digital images which are called device referred. All right, uh, HDR panorama, I want to show you a little bit here. And there's a term, HDRI. Well, I don't consider a pan panorama as an image, but it's a panorama. So I'm going to start calling them HDRPs instead of HDRI in the future. There's a couple of ways for years I've been using this little remote shutter. Really important, you want to keep your camera still, trying to keep the pixels lined up. Everything else is moving in the real world try to keep the camera as still as possible. It'll cause a lot of problems down the road. But uh, Sam Ron turned me on to this little promote controller. It's got a few little deals I don't like about it, but it's really saved me a lot of uh, finger clicks or clicks and you can totally automate the bracketed set. Also hooked a little RC remote deal. There's a guy, Steve, at PanelCam, a mixed thing called PanelCam Software. Uh, I've used this to produce the Missouri Theater Center for the Arts virtual tour has got 50 panoramas. This thing's really neat. It's got an interval meter. You can do starting out at hour long for the first exposure bracketed sets of it. It works really well. Runs on a Nintendo DS. And this is an example of what I shoot. Just like what you guys are doing. Six round, one up. I don't shoot the Nadar. It's too hard to do in these places. They're full of unlevel floors, a bunch of crunchy stuff on the floor. And I got a little trick for the tripod cap anyway. But start out, and this is a typical example, F16. Everything's manual. Uh, remote shutter, F16, manual focus. Uh, Omar told me a little trick to start taping down my lens. I'm going to start doing that. Uh, set the white balance usually at daylight. And the thing is, you want to pace yourself. I want to shoot this thing as quick as I can because everything's moving around. The trees are moving, the light's moving, the shadows. So uh, outside is pretty quick. Inside, it might take me 10 minutes to shoot a panel inside. But And something else I want to talk to you about, uh, the nodal point. Well, that's really important technically to get everything stitched up, but it goes way beyond that. That's the viewpoint for when the panorama is made. That's what your end user is going to view the panorama from. And I find myself getting lazy with digital. When I was shooting film, 36, rows, 36 exposure roll, I really, really, really worked it, the composition. A little over this way, a little over this way. I want to make every frame count. But with digital, it seems like I'm just flipping it up there and firing it off really quick. So I kind of pretend my eyeball is like a little ball. 
and it changes so much. This viewpoint being down here to over here to over here to where that view is going to be. Uh, just kind of stop and take a few moments before you start firing off a shot. It'll probably be a lot better the end result. Now, I'm going to walk you through on my process of making a panorama. First thing I'm going to do is, been out shooting all day, get back home, got a bunch of memory cards full, I shoot everything in raw, copy everything over, I use Apple, copy everything over, make a folder of the location, copy all my raw files over to it. This is the bracket I said, I load them in Adobe Lightroom, this is coming out of the remote controller, it doesn't know. I got less shots this way in a really dark corner than I do shooting out this really bright window in a dark room. So what I do is I go through and I flag all the ones that are really hot, really, they're just dark, there's no information, flag them all and just delete them out of there. Then I export everything as a 16-bit TIFF and I actually reduce it down. I shoot at the uh, Canon 5D Mark II, start out with the 5D but I've calculated out and I export them out as a 3,000 by 2,000 pixel based image. Then, while that's exporting for hours, I shoot three, 4,000 images on a Saturday. So that might take, I got a quad uh, Intel box, it might take a couple of hours for all that to write out. And while that's doing that, I go back in the Lightroom and I start at the top of all my images, the good ones, and you can see the bracketed set here for one position of the panorama head from the darkest to the brightest, and here's the frame number. Then I get out my pencil and paper and I write all the numbers down. Well, that's, so I got a guide to go by. These are each position of the panorama head for the location I shot that day. Sometimes I end up with six, eight pages of these. And I also shoot stills as well. So here's a little deal, I kind of make a note, and these are the stills that I want to use. It's the numbers, the guide numbers. Been using uh, Photomatix exclusively. Kind of would like to experiment and learn some new stuff I've been learning about here at the festival. And I do tone mapping all of my work. So here we got my page of frame numbers. I select that range there, so that's like 4,565 to 4574. Select that on the Macintosh, and I drop it down on the Photomatics icon and let it do its thing. It process it into an HDR image. Uh, I've got enough horsepower, I actually would just run this whole column and end up with 20 of them at one time, unprocessed, untone map. There's a, uh, a preference that has a couple of options in it. There's also a preference that you can bypass these settings that are always the same, always the same, always the same. You just bypass and it helps speed up that a little bit. Uh, then there's also ways you can save out the HDR file and there's different types of file formats options for you there. Next thing is I want to tone map my images. So you can see here's a stack from this location, six round, one up. This is an, the actual HDR image right here. Next thing, I want to tone map it. And there it is. When you tone map it, there's all types of controls in here. A lot of them I leave at default, but I encourage you to experiment with them and adjust it to your liking. Don't be afraid of, of it. Just play with it and have fun. It's, you'll learn a lot from doing that. There's kind of a quick overview of some of the controls it offers. Wide range. It's actually got, started out, I don't even know if it was 1.0, but it's got a lot better. I can see a definite improvement. My work's actually showcased on HDR Soft site. And for all the attendees today at Pamela, if you go to my website, 360icon.com, photomatics.html, or you can go to the HDR site, you can download a 30-day trial version, Windows PC, uh, you get 30% off, which would be $66 USA. But it's only good until the end of this month here. Okay, so now, I, okay. Next, I want to do some touch-ups. So I have a huge folder of all my tone mapped images. I open them all up in Photoshop. And I do little, uh, first of all, 
when I tone map some of them at the 3,000 by 2,000, they could change a couple of pixels. It might be 2998 by 2,000. They, they vary. And some of them are right on the money. They still stay at the 3,000 by 2,000. So I write a little, little, made a little action in Photoshop and batch all of them and make them all the same size. Then I open all, all of them back up again. And I look for sometimes the little leg sticking out. I use a feathered clone tool for that. Get rid of the little thing sticking out there. Uh, I use uh, Mark II. We're out in really dirty places. I gotta change the lenses. My camera's filthy. It's a nightmare keeping it clean. So I touch up the dust specks in the images. Chromatic fringe, there's ways to process that, ways to correct halos in these things, do that. After all the touch-ups are done, next I'm ready to render the panorama itself. Uh, I've been using RealBiz Stitcher for years. Uh, that's a dead deal there, so I'm relatively new, but I'm really, uh, really, really, really like uh, PT GUI. Uh, and I'll kind of show you what I, so this is an example. Here's our location, Panos. And these are all the rooms we shot. Inside of one of them, here's our seven images that I need to produce the panorama. Six round, one up. Take them, load them into Photomatic, uh, PTGUI. Uh, rotate them 90 degrees and align the images. Same workflow you guys got. But these are what I make my prints from as well. So I hold the shift option and I drag it to compose where it's visually. I kind of like the composition of it and I level the horizon. When you do that, it kind of warps it out a little bit and I'll straighten it all out. Then I ex render it at 6,000 by 3,000 as a 16-bit uh, TIFF file. Uh, works great. And then I create the panorama. Really like PTGUI. Real biz, it was a night thing. I'd queue everything up and it'd take all night, even on a high-end Macintosh, to render all this. While one of these things is uh, processing, I go back and start getting another one ready for stitching. And by the time it's ready to go, the last one's done. So in an hour, I can stitch 20, 30 panels. It's really, really fast now for me. We got more touch-ups now, too. Now that they're all rendered, I want to open them back up in Photoshop and look for more little things. And, you, and up until the digital, this was actually a way to control in printing photographs. The tonal range was dodging and burning and, and maybe some graduated filters. So I'll do a little dodging and burning in certain areas to my liking. Uh, in sky, sometimes there's some noise. I use the uh, Noisewear Pro with a um, feathered marquee in certain sky areas to kind of take some of the noise out of it. And then, after that, I open them back up into Adobe Lightroom. They look really flat to me in my eyes. So, uh, I really don't do a lot here, but I kind of crisp up the blacks. Uh, very little fill light, maybe and the clarity really enhances the clarity but don't want to do it too much maybe some of my older stuff is really cooked too much maybe so and these little controls right here are individual per it's amazing what you can do with these but uh 30 day trial thing on this i highly wreck adobe lightroom it's it's awesome and then i save it out as an 8-bit uh tip at this point. I keep the master 16-bit uh, file untouched. Now, tripod cap. I'm about done. Two, two minutes. Okay, no problem. I almost, almost got it. Um, tripod cap. Since we got all this unlevel floor and everything, and I'm not shooting the Nadar, uh, and it still runs really great, it's QB converter. I dropped that tip out of Lightroom on it, Dice it up into cubes. Open that bottom one up in Photoshop. I got my master tripod cap logo. Paste it right on top, a layer in Photoshop. Rotate it to where I want the degree of the pano starting out at. Flatten it. Take it back into QB converter. Convert it back into an EQ image. And at that point, I save it out as a JPEG. First time on the lower end. But I save it out 
uh, for playback, I actually opened back up in Adobe Fireworks. I even found that exporting it out as a web thing out of Photoshop is still high file form, too much file size. And it seems like Fireworks really does a really good job at about 70% compression on that. And now we're ready to play it back, the panorama that we've just been going through. Uh, I really like KR Pano. I, I've learned how to do some XML over the winter months, and it's really easy now on the design of my site to include certain things and not put certain things depending on the subject matter per location. And I can edit just a few lines of the code in there, and it's up and running really quick after all the image processing. The image processing to me is the evil of all of it. I really enjoy getting out and exploring with Cindy and Lori. That's the most fun of all. And when I get back home, it becomes work and, and really tedious and long hours. But then it, inevitably, I get to play it back and see where we've been that day. Uh, here's an example of this little interface. You can rotate it, uh, zoom in and out. It's got really nice controls. Uh, I've made a little thing for planetoids in this, or little planets, a pan tilt meter. And these are all fun things for my end user to experiment and have fun with. Also put a particle emanator in there. And there's all kinds of like dust specks and uh, holes and different things to play around with that aren't real, but kind of fun to look at. Let's see if it's set. And uh, you can find me at info at uh, 360 Icon. And I'm on Facebook at uh, Facebook 360 Icon. I kind of play with certain things and post them on there. Or if we go out exploring, I put them on here first for my friends. If you'd like to be a friend, send, come on, it would be great. Um, thank you very much today. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ken.